Hello. How are you? Good. You glad to be in church? Good. Good, good. Me too. Uh, glad to be here. Excited to be with you this weekend and just want to say welcome to everyone. Uh, I want to say hello to everyone who's watching online and I want to say hello to North Kansas City. Welcome in. So glad that everybody is here. Welcome to Vineyard Church. Before we get into the message today, there's a, a few things that I want to talk about How many of you have been uh, participating in our 21 days of prayer and fasting? Has God been speaking to you, been doing good things in your life? I've just felt like this has been such an incredible, special time for our church. Uh, And uh, just been a a really good season for us as as we kind of set ourselves up foundationally for what I believe God wants to do um, throughout this year and throughout uh, our lives going through, uh, going forward. And so... Uh, what I'm excited about, though, is that um, this fast comes to a close uh, Sunday night, and it all culminates with our night of worship. Uh, and I, I got to challenge you to be there. Do not miss this. Sunday night, 6 o'clock, night of worship and baptisms. Uh, we've got a, a number of people signed up to be baptized. In, in fact, uh, we are, we're getting the tank warmed up right now. For the people, I can't get too wild tonight or I'm going to model baptism. Um, But but I I just want to encourage you, be a part of this night, kind of the culmination of the fast and just believe that God wants to to meet us in a very, very special way as we close out the fast. Then you can leave and go eat and get back on social media and do all the stuff that you haven't done. Uh, after that, that night of worship is over, but, but please lean into this. Don't miss it. I want to I- invite you to be a part of that. The other thing I want to tell you about is I- I'm so excited about this. Well, we're going to introduce something called Vision Night. Uh, and that is really what this night is all about. Vision Night is on February the 27th. We're going to start at 6.30 p.m. And this is what Vision Night is all about. It's a year. It's a time for us to celebrate all that God has done over the course of the last year, but also to cast vision for what we feel like God is going to do at Vineyard Church. And, and here's what I want to tell you. We're going to be making announcements about big things that are happening in the church, casting vision for the future. Uh, and this is on that one night. And, and I'm going to tell you, I cannot be more adamant in telling you that this is a night that you do not want to miss. It is going to be one of the biggest things that we do all year. And, and let me say this too. There is a limited amount of people that can come. This auditorium only holds a certain number of people. So across all of our services. So we're going to ask you to get registered to come to Vision Night. If you go to vckc.com, you're going to find a registration link to get signed up for Vision Night but I'm going to tell you, what I'm, I'm hearing like testimonies that we're going to celebrate. You don't want to miss them. I know the insider information about things that we are launching in 2022. You do not want to miss this night. So as, as much as I can say to encourage you to be a part of that, go to the website, get signed up. Do not miss Vision Night. Have I made it clear? You do not want to miss that. So, so get signed up. For that incredible, incredible things going to be going on that night. Last thing uh, before we get into uh, the into the message today, I uh, <clears throat> I got a, a uh, an Instagram DM late uh, a few nights ago, and it was from Pastor Oscar, who leads uh, our church that we have in Quito, Ecuador. Uh, and I, I hadn't been online that much, and I didn't realize that there had been a mudslide that had hit Quito where the church was uh, and had affected some of the people. And he was saying, just letting me know hey, that they needed help uh, with some stuff and the people that they were trying to reach out to and people that they were trying to help. And he sent us a video that he put together um, just to, to let us know what was happening in Quito. And I, I want you to take a look at this.
with a group from La Viña. We have been working for three days to remove the mud from the affected families. Teenagers, women and men of La Viña Church have been going to work in the flood zone and now we're gathering food and clothes to the affected families. What I'm <clears throat> grateful for is I'm grateful for, first of all, I'm grateful for Pastor Oscar, who has a heart for his community, to immediately have their people go out with shovels and start digging that stuff up. But I'm grateful for Vineyard Church in Kansas City, who has generous people, because when I got that message, we were Im immediately able to release funds. We bought that family beds, clothes, boxes of food. Uh, they've been able to be housed in the church where their house gets out. And so I just want to say thank you for your generosity. You don't know it, but you've impacted the lives of pe in people in Quito, Ecuador. Uh, and you get to saw th see the face of Elizabeth, but her family, who you haven't got to see, and other people in that community are being blessed because of your faithfulness. And so we were able to immediately be able to help them release funds. Pastor Oscar went and got beds and clothes and food. And so let me just say thank you. Thank you for your faithfulness that allows us to invest in the lives of people. It, it, it is so incredible for me as the pastor of this church to be able to say yes when things like that happen. And the only reason I get to do that is because of your faithfulness and your generosity. So thank you so much. We'll put the ways that you can give up on the screens. We have kiosks in the back of the room where you can uh, drop your offering if you came prepared to give in person. But thank you so much. You're making a difference, not just in Kansas City, but around the world. So thank you so much for your faithfulness. All right. Are you ready to get into the Word today? Yeah. We are in the last week of our series called Oddities. Uh, and we have been walking through strange weird instances in the Bible and saying, what is it that they can speak to us? How can we learn from them? What is it that they're, that they're trying to say? Because the facts are there is weird stuff in Scripture. And so uh, instead of shying away from it or pretending like it's not there, let's spend some time on it and figure it out. And as we've been kind of walking through this, I just thought that it would be good as we get to the last um, sermon in this series that we talk about Jesus. We've seen odd, weird things that have happened throughout Scripture, and I just want to be clear, in no way is Jesus exempt from doing weird stuff. Uh, and that is the case from the story that we see here. We're going to find it in the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, in fact, Matthew is the only one to record this story, and it's only four verses long. But like everything with Jesus, uh, when we look at it, it's not just what he did, but it's why he did it. And there's so much for us to grab onto and so much for us to learn on from just these four verses. And so I really want to just look at this story, but also what does it say about who Jesus is? So we're going to be in Matthew 17. We're going to start in verse 24. And it says this, On their arrival in Capernaum, 
the collectors of the temple tax came to Peter and asked him, doesn't your teacher pay the temple tax? So the backdrop of our story today is Capernaum. Capernaum is a small fishing village on the coast of the Sea of Galilee. And Capernaum had become a trade route that when people were coming from the east going into Jerusalem, it was a place to stop and stay and also to trade. And because it was close to the sea, there was seafood and things for people to gather in that place. But beyond it being that, it was also Peter's hometown. In fact, if you go to Capernaum today, both this temple that they're talking about and Peter's house have been excavated. You can find them both in this place in Capernaum. The reason, and this is so fascinating to me, this is just a side note from this message, but so fascinating to me, when they found this house, the reason that they believed that they had found Peter's house is first they knew that he was from there, but they found this house and on the walls, this rock structure of this home that had been built, they found the shape of what we would call the Jesus fish on the wall of this house and believed it to be a hub of the faith and believed that to be Peter's home. So this is his town where he lived, where he worked out of as a fisherman, where his family lived. And when Jesus and the disciples came to town, they would stay in Peter's house. And so they come into town. They've been out doing ministry. They come into town and, and they go by and these priests, these tax collectors for the temple stop Peter and they say, doesn't your master pay the temple tax. Now we can't really tell, tell from the tone of what we read if this was an accusation or if they were genuinely posing the question. And I think probably because our first inclination when we hear the priests talk about Jesus is to believe they had some sort of um, impure motive for why they were asking. But here in this text, we can't really tell. <clears throat> what we do know though is that the temple tax is not a new thing. 1,400 years before Jesus showed up, the temple tax was established. Here's the history of the temple tax. The people are in the wilderness. They've escaped slavery in Egypt, <clears throat> and they're moving out into the wilderness, and they're going um, through to make their way into the promised land. And God speaks to Moses and starts to talk to him about Break, break, beginning this new covenant between God and his people and establishing a tabernacle where the presence of God would be housed, establishing the Levites as the priests who would run this temple. And, <clears throat> and they were trying to, I'm gonna have to get some water. <clears throat> Let's see if that's any better for now. <clears throat> so, establishing this new covenant with God and creating this tabernacle in order for them to be able to house and meet with God in this place. What happens is that Moses goes up onto the mountain, this cloud settles on the mountain, and then really for eight chapters of scripture, God just downloads instructions to, to Moses, just gives him here is what the temple is going to look like. And this is what the Ark of the Covenant looks like. And, and this is how you're going to build these things. And, and this is what the priests are going to wear. Just gives him all of this information. Chapter after chapter, instruction after instruction. And when God is near the end of the instruction, he implements this thing called temple tax. So if we go to Exodus verse 30, starting in verse 11, it says this. Then the Lord said to Moses, Whenever you take a census of the people of Israel, each man who is counted must pay, and I want you to look at this language, a ransom for himself to the Lord. Then no plague will strike the people as you count them. Each person who is counted must give a small piece of silver as a sacred offering to the Lord. This payment is a half a shekel based on the sanctuary shekel, which equals 20 garaz. All who have reached their 20th birthday must give this sacred offering to the Lord. When this offering is given to the Lord to purify their lives, making you right with him, the rich must not give more than the specified amount, and the poor must not give less. Receive this ransom from the Israelites and use it for the care of the tabernacle, and it will bring the Israelites to the Lord's attention, and it will purify your lives. 
So again, this is 1,400 years before Jesus. People had been paying this tax for a very long time as instructed by God. But when it was instructed for them to pay this tax, they were wanderers in the wilderness. They didn't have occupations. They didn't have trades. They weren't making money. They didn't have any income. There wasn't any giving or tithing at the, at the temple. There wasn't any offerings being made. And so the way that the tabernacle was cared for and maintained was this. And so in the time when the people settled into the promised land and they had jobs and trade at the temple, tithes and offerings became established. People were giving to the temple, but the tax was still being collected. It, and here's the thing. The tithe and offerings were, were things that people were giving to the church. And so this tax was no longer an obligation legally, but it was an obligation societally. There was pressure for you to participate. If it was a legal obligation, the priests wouldn't have to ask if Jesus paid it. It would have just been like, obviously it's a tax that you pay. But instead, they posed the question, does he pay it or doesn't he pay it? As though you would be looked down on if you didn't pay it. And it wasn't a ton of money, but it wasn't nothing. This temple tax basically represented at that time what would have been about two days wages. And they're asking him, does Jesus pay it? And I asked you as we were reading through that section in Exodus to pay attention to the language. When, when God is giving the instruction to Moses, he's saying, pay this tax as a ransom for the individual for them to be counted. Do you, do you recognize it and all that language in Scripture given as a ransom to the Lord? Several times this command came from the Lord and reference is made to the significance of this collection for this basically half shekel for each man. It was given as a ransom. It was an offering for the Lord to make atonement for themselves. God counted the half shekel as a ransom for the life of the man who gave it. And that man would be numbered in a census. And I just don't think that it's mere coincidence that attention is drawn to the presence of Jesus with respect to this particular tax. When he comes into town, they bring up Jesus and this particular tax. That tax from long ago that pointed ahead to the Messiah or to the Savior who would become the ransom for every life and every person who placed their trust in him. So when, G, when God establishes this thing, he says, this offering, this tax will act as a ransom for the life of the individual. Jesus comes into Capernaum and these tax collectors go, where is the ransom from this man? Does he not pay it? And when they're saying it, do they have any idea who he is? No. They have no clue who they're talking about. But here's what I can tell you. What I can tell you is not only was he about to give this offering, he was about to give it in a whole new way. Mark 10, 45 says it this way, for even the son of man came not to be served, but to serve others and look, to give his life as a ransom for many. This tax 1400 years ago was set up to point to Jesus. And now here are the priests asking if he's going to pay it. Well, not only was he going to pay the ransom tax, but soon he was going to be paying for it all once and for all on the cross. Why? Because Jesus became the ransom for our debt. Not just for his debt. He didn't have a debt to pay. He was perfect. But we had a debt to pay. In the same way that we had to, this tax was set up was this symbolism pointing forward to what would become the ultimate ransom in Jesus. So the priests don't know what they're talking about. And Peter doesn't know what to say. <laughs> he pays the tax, doesn't he? 
Okay, well, we see it in Peter's response, Matthew 17, 25. Yes, he does. Peter replied, then he went to the house. <laughs> Peter is just like, okay, I mean, I don't know what to do. <laughs> what to do with this. But they came to Peter. This is Peter's hometown. He would have grown up there. The priest would have known who he was. They go to him. I know this guy that you're running about, you're running around with. We heard about him. Is he going to pay the ransom? Just think about that language for a minute. Does that not just strike you a little bit? And so Peter goes, yes. (laughs) And then he takes off towards the house. But look, look at the rest of verse 25. But before he had a chance to speak, Jesus asked him, What do you think, Peter? Do kings tax their own people or the people they have conquered? First, Peter doesn't really know how to answer. And he probably just says yes, trying to defend Jesus and just get out of there. Because he felt this societal pressure to pay this tax. If you didn't pay, you'd be judged. And Peter didn't want anyone to think ill of Jesus, so he just says, yes. And then he gets out of there. And he hurries down to the house, and as he's making his way down there, he's got to be thinking, okay, well, i got to bring this up to Jesus. i got to figure out how we're going to come across this. I think that he wants to pay it, but I'm not really sure if he wants to pay it. And so, like, I don't want to, I don't really know what to say. And so Peter walks through the door and he's like built himself up on this walk from the temple down to his house, ready to just be like, it's not confrontational, but like he knows that he's got to get an answer. And I just said yes, but was I supposed to say yes? And I don't know what to do. And he walks in the house and before he can even say anything, he steps in the house and Jesus just goes, hey, Peter, do you think that kings <laughs> tax their own people or the people they have conquered? Peter's on his way down thinking, how am I going to bring this up? But before he can say anything and he walks through the door, Jesus just starts in. I think to me, do you know what this is like to me? Did you ever come home as a kid (laughs) and you walk through the door and your parents said, do you have anything that you'd like to tell us? (laughs) And your brain just starts to scramble. With all the things. Because there's more than one thing. And you're just panicked, right? Like, man, which thing do I... So you just stand there. It's like a Western showdown. The two of you staring at each other. Who's going to flinch first? And parents don't say, like, we know. We don't say anything. We just give the stare. And eventually you go, no. (laughs) This is the way I, I, I think about this. Peter walking into the house, and it's like Jesus is going, I know what's going on. And I I hate to break it to all the young people in the room, but parents usually know more than you think that they do. But in Peter's case, it's way worse (laughs) because he's dealing with Jesus who knew everything. Peter has this conversation at the temple and Jesus is at the house, but when Peter walks in, Jesus just starts in with, well, Peter, what do you think? And Jesus, in this moment, is showing his sovereignty, that he can see and knows everything. And while there is discomfort in these moments, confronted by people trying to figure out how to answer, suddenly discovering that Jesus already knows and has intimately been acquainted with what's happening to you should bring some comfort. Because there is nothing that he doesn't know. There is nothing that he cannot see. David wrote it this way in Psalm 139. O Lord, you have examined my heart, and you know everything about me. You know when I sit down or stand up. You know my thoughts even when I'm far away. You see me when I travel and when I rest at home. You know everything I 
do. You know what I'm going to say even before I say it, Lord. You go before me and you follow me. You place your hand of blessing on my head. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too great for me to understand. Do you ever think about the power of that? That he sees everything about me. He sees everywhere I go and every conversation that I have. In fact, he knows what I'm going to say before I say it. And what I'm going to do before I do it. But do you know what's powerful to me about this section of Scripture that we just read? Because you read, you go before me, you stay behind me, you know what I'm going to say, you know what I'm going to do. And when you get all the way down to the bottom, do you know what it says? But yet you put your hand of blessing on me. You know my thoughts. You've searched the inside of me. It's not great in there all of the time. And the things that I do are not great all of the time. And the way that I act is not great all of the time, but you choose to be with me and to bless me anyway. And isn't that powerful? The idea that the sovereign God who sees everything, that Jesus would know everything, and Jesus knows all that you've done, and he loves you anyway. Do you see the power in that? That's what this story shows is that the nature of Jesus and our relationship with him. Peter walks in weighed down by not knowing how to deal with this situation, but Jesus already knows that the problem exists, and because he is Jesus, he already knows the answer, and the way that he approaches it is with a question. In his sovereignty, in his knowledge, he knows exactly what needs to get done. Let's go back and look at it again. Yes, he does, Peter replied, and then he walked into the house. And before he had a chance to speak, Jesus asked him, what do you think, Peter? Do kings tax their own people or the people they have conquered? In his sovereignty, Jesus begins to address the problem. And he does it by posing this question to Peter. So Peter answers, verse 26, they tax the people they have conquered. Peter replied, well then, Jesus said, the citizens are free. Jesus is in this conversation establishing who he is. The temple is the house of God. And Jesus, as the embodiment of God in human form, and he is the king of kings, he asks this question, do kings tax their own people? Now, when you read that, you think of it as subjects, but that translation can really be, do kings tax their family? Not his subjects, but his family. So Peter, do, does a king tax his family or the people that he's conquered? In other words, understand this tax. They're being pressured to pay. Is it intended for me to pay? So people are forced to do this. But people who are my family, people who are connected to me don't have to live under societal pressure or obligation to do what is expected of them. Remember, tithes and offerings are established, so Jesus is saying, we're free of this tax obligation because anybody who is my family as the king is not under obligation to do this. So who is his family? John 1, he addresses it, but all who believed in him and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. So he's saying, hey, look, Peter, does a king tax his family or, or does he tax people that he's conquered? Well, God, I'm going to assume, God, that he does not, you know, tax his family. Okay, well, then we're free of the tax. And Peter's like, okay, well, I guess I answered wrong then. I thought that you would pay it because you're children. So here's the question, though. Is it really about the tax? We said this before, the tax was called a ransom. And when it was established, it was pointing to Jesus who would ultimately pay the ultimate ransom by going to the cross. So what is he saying here? He's saying, as my sons and daughter, as my family, you're under no obligation to pay. Why? Because I already paid it. 
And I think in the same way, you don't have to be under the obligation to pay because of your sin. You've accepted me, your family, your debt has been paid. Your family, your debt has been paid. And who is family? Anybody who's accepted him is family. Look, do you see what Jesus is saying? It's not about tax. He's establishing who he is with Peter in this moment. You feel the societal pressure to act a certain way, to be a certain thing, to, to feel that they're trying to get you to do this thing. Here's what I'm trying to tell you. You are free from all of that. You don't have to live under the expectations of because everybody does it, you've got to. Because you live, because everyone lives a certain way, you have to. You're free of all that obligation. Why? Because you're my son and daughter. Because I, I paid the ransom. I paid it for you. So this is Jesus establishing who he is. And he's bringing it into our lives. And he sets up in this way, and it's the way that Jesus does things, the way that he's doing it with Peter, is the way that he does things in our lives again and again. Jesus knows our problems. He knows the solution. And he teaches us something on the way. But him saying that in that moment is not the end of the story. Hey, we're good. Your sons and daughters, you don't have to pay the tax. And if we ended the story here, you guys would be like, nothing weird happened. That was like the whole point of this series. You're right. <laughs> here we go. Jesus has clearly established he feels no obligation to pay the tax. So his next words are odd. It's the beginning of verse 17. However, we don't want to offend them. <laughs> Now, it can be translated this way. We don't want to do anything that would make them stumble. He spends this time establishing that there is no obligation to pay the tax. Hey, look, I'm the king. You're under no obligation to pay the tax. And Peter's like, okay, well, good. I gave the wrong answer. I'll let them know next time. We're good. We're not paying the tax. And so he establishes all of this, and then Jesus goes, however, we don't want to do anything that would make them stumble. In fact, uh, I'm just going to make a way for us to go ahead and pay it. And doesn't it just seem kind of contrary but what he's saying is, is that if not paying this tax is going to put something on our lives that would make somebody disconnect from me, then we're not going to do that. The Apostle Paul, when he's talking about living life, puts it this way. Let's stop condemning each other. Decide instead to live in such a way that you will not cause another believer to stumble and fall. What Jesus is saying is your relationship with me has given you freedom. Freedom from the obligation to live like everybody else. Freedom from the obligation to fall under societal pressures. But look, but what you do with your freedom matters. And if not paying this tax will destroy the message, uproot reputation, or make it harder for people to believe, then let's pay it. Do you see that the dichotomy of these two things? You're under no obligation to pay it. But if whatever you do with your life will make it harder for people to truly know me, then don't let it be a stumbling block for somebody else. So Jesus is saying, let our actions and our conduct not be the thing that prevents people from believing. Don't even let the freedom that I found in my relationship be with Jesus, let in Jesus be a stumbling block for anyone. And you know what blows my mind often? How Christian people act. Do you know, and this is a fact, I've read article after article of this, do you know when the, the, the time that most servers 
do not want to wait tables. Sunday when church lets out. You'll read it again and again. The people are the rudest and they tip the worst. The people who leave church and go to restaurants treat servers the worst. You, you leave church, you've had this time with God, you'd think you'd walk in with a spirit of kindness and a measure of generosity. But for some reason in our minds, we've got this idea that we, because we've found this freedom that we can look at other people with judgment who haven't found what we found. But God has given us this freedom, but what you do with the freedom matters. How you act matters. How you treat others matters. The Apostle Paul said it this way in Galatians 5, for you've been called to live in freedom, my brothers and sisters, but don't use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature. Instead, use your freedom to serve one another in love. So let's pay the tax. Let's pay the tax. Don't let it be a stumbling block for anybody. Okay, Jesus, should I go ask Judas for some of the money? I'll just go grab it and we can go pay the tax really fast. But Jesus continues in verse 26. Here's the weird part. So go down to the lake, throw in a line, open the mouth of the first fish that you catch, and you will find a large silver coin. Take it and pay the tax for both of us. Okay. That is weird. That's a very odd solution. And, and I look at it this way. Look, Jesus could have pulled a coin out from behind Peter's ear like a magician at a kid's party. But he's, look how intentional his language is. Hey, go down to the lake. This is the Sea of Galilee. Go down to the lake. Cast out a line, pull it in, first fish you catch, open its mouth, there's going to be a coin, go pay the tax. And, and just think of like everything that Peter's encountered in like the last hour. He's confronted by the priests. Hey, is your master? He pays the tax, right? Yes. I don't know. Hey, Peter, we're under no obligation to pay that tax because I'm the ransom that pays for it all. Okay, sounds good. But we're going to pay the tax because we don't want to be a stumbling block for anybody to understand the goodness of being in relationship with me. All right, sounds good. Let's pay it. Yeah, here's how you're going to pay it. But Jesus is challenging Peter to put action to his freedom. If you're going to be allowed the freedom that you have found in me, don't only just not let it hinder your reputation or people around you, but take some action to lay out the blessing. So let's look at it. Go down to the lake. This is the Sea of Galilee. That is 33 miles around. He doesn't say, go stand on this shore. He doesn't go say, stand in this spot, go down to the lake. Okay, that's vague. Walk down to the lake. Cast out a line. This is the only time in the New Testament that hook fishing is talked about. Every other instance where they are fishing is net fishing. Every other instance, if you can read the whole New Testament, you won't find it. You'll find them casting out other nets and catching hundreds of fish in their nets. This is the only instance where Jesus says, take a hook and go down and grab the one fish. This isn't Peter, who is a, a, a fisherman by trade. This isn't his normal way of fishing. And Jesus was taking the thing that Peter knew and bringing blessing into his life, but he still had to go make the effort. And Jesus says, open the mouth of the first fish you'll find and you'll find a coin. He didn't want Peter to go down 
and to cast a net and to pull in a hundred fish and check the mouths of each of them. He said, go down to the lake, cast your hook in and pull the first thing in and the blessing that you need in order to bless somebody else is going to be in there. Now, I want you to see this. God said, take your history, take your past, take your knowledge, take the thing that you need to do and put some action to it. And when you do, I've got a specific blessing that I'm going to use to show people who I am. No, I don't want you to miss it because God will take, you say God knows all of you and yet he still loves you. Look, he knows all of you and he's redeemed you and he'll take everything that you've been through, everything that you're past, and he'll put you in a position to use all of it to grab the specific thing that he's got for you so that he can bless you so that you can bless somebody else. Don't miss it. He'll take your past. He'll take your pain. He'll take your giftings. He'll take your ability and he'll say, go. Take that because he could have just said, hey, look, I'm good at this. Here's a coin. But he said, I'm going to need you to put action to what I'm saying. I, I'm going to need you to walk it out. This is a, this is a thing that I, I, I think people miss often. We, we pray prayers like this. God, would you direct me? Would you lead me? Would you take me where I need to go? And I, I tell people all the time, I, I think if you ever prayed like God, just be my steering wheel. Direct me where you need me to go. And I tell people all the time, okay, you get in the car, you sit down in the driver's seat and you turn the wheel all the way left. Which way are you going? The answer is nowhere. You haven't started moving yet. You want God to direct you, but you're gonna have to start moving in order for him to lead you. So this is what I'm trying to say. God was saying, hey, look, we're not under obligation to do things like anybody else. But we're going to live in a way that brings honor to relationship with me so we don't cause anyone else to stumble and to miss what I've got for them. So in order for me to use your life, you are going to have to put some action to it and go down and be obedient to the things that I'm telling you to do. And when you do, I've got something specific for you. God has a specific blessing for you. And I think that we want to go down and we want to cast the net real wide and catch everything and just hope that something's for us. And God is saying, hey, no, look, do you understand? God could have done this anyway, but he told a fisherman to go fish. God, God could have blessed it. God could have paid this temple tax anyway, but he told a fisherman, hey, look, take what you know. But I don't want you to cast it wide. I've got something specific that I want to do in your life. The same God who goes before you and stays bef behind you and knows your thought, he knows what you need. And he'll take everything that you've been through and every place that you've been and he'll set you up to bring in the thing that will be a blessing specific for you that will help other people discover who he is. He's got a blessing for you, but it's for you. He's got a plan, and it's for you. He's got something for you, and it's not the same plan as the whole world. It's a plan that's just for you. It's specific for you. He knows you. He knows your thoughts. He knows when you get up. He knows when you sit down. He's in front of you and he's behind you. He knows the words you're going to say before you even say them. And he's got something specific for you. You haven't been left out. You haven't been counted out. And your past doesn't mean that you can't do something in the future. He'll take everything that you've been through and he'll use it as an opportunity for you to grab the blessing that he's got for you so that other people can know him. What does Philippians 4.19 say? And this same God who takes care of me will supply all of your needs from his glorious riches which have been given to us in Christ Jesus. Here's the last thing I want to show you. That coin that he pulls out of his mouth, the one coin is enough for him to pay the tax for Jesus and for himself. 
He doesn't just, Jesus doesn't go, you know what, we're gonna, I'll go ahead and pay that tax. Will you run down and grab that coin for me? And then just run it up to the temple and tell them that it's my tax? Now when he reels it in and he grabs that coin, it was enough for Jesus and for Peter. God blessed Peter to pay his tax because he was obedient to do his work. He was obedient to walk out what God told him to do. And that specific blessing, in that specific way for Peter, opened the door for it to be a testimony to the lives of people. God's got something specific for you. That's what I want you to walk away with. God has something specific for you. Maybe you've been casting your net real wide. Maybe you've been living in a way that doesn't show people that you're a son or daughter of Jesus. But God's got something specific for you. And I really just have a sense that there are some people who feel as though they've been disqualified. Who don't feel that family connection to him because you feel like what you've done and if he really knew everything it would disqualify you I just want you to know I sense it in my heart he knows what you've done and he loves you anyway and he's still got something specific for you he's got something for you and that's what I want to pray for you we pray together. God, in my heart, I just feel like there are people who have been trying to figure out how to walk this life out. Been trying to live under the pressure of what it feels like because they think there's certain expectations on them and obligations that society's put on them and mindsets that they have to have. And in this moment, God, would you just reveal to them the family nature of you that you've accepted them in? And so even the pressure that the world puts on them, they're no under, under no obligation to live under. But God, would you give them the strength to walk life out in a way that honors who you are and wouldn't be a stumbling block for anyone else? And would they do that through obedience? And so, Lord, would you show people who feel lost, don't know where they're going, that you know them, you see them, you care for them, and you have something specific for them. that you'll use their hurt. You'll use their pain. You'll use their history and their background, their skill sets and their knowledge to open up a door for them to be a blessing in the lives of other people with something that's specific for them because you know them that well. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to give you just a moment of reflection to allow God to speak to you and just see how he would move on your heart. Maybe he's got something specific that he wants to give to you, an instruction that he wants to make clear, a line that he wants you to cast out, something that he wants you to reel in. But I want to give space for him to speak. Would you stand with me? I'm going to ask our prayer team to come and be available and if you're walking through something and you want someone to partner with you in prayer, you want somebody to connect with you and walk through the things that you're walking through, maybe you need to pray for that specific thing that God's got for you. Would you allow him to speak to you tonight? Would you partner with one of these people in prayer? I'll come back in a moment and close with the blessing, but don't miss what God wants to speak to you tonight. Lean into his voice and allow him to speak to you right now.